Welcome to Christian Ministry Central. I'm Tom West, and I teach the Bible on this YouTube channel. I'm going to share a message called The Call to Holiness from 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. I put the, this is the one I'm going through first and second Peter on the, this series, put it out late in the day on Sunday, and this will go out uh, Sunday the 8th of uh, September, 2024, yeah, late in the day, because I preach in the morning and do some other things, so it's later in the day when I finally get around to, I re record this in, uh, a week or so early. I hope that you'll subscribe to my channel. I teach the Bible here, and uh, uh, I teach, teach. I have a, I have a message on late on Sunday. Then I have another message sometime on Friday. I put out a Bible study on Wednesday in the middle of the week. Every day I do my daily Bible reading that I do, my devotions. I share those with you, and I'll put out three or four uh, short thoughts. If you have a prayer need, put it in the comments. I'll pick up on it. And I'll do a little less than a minute prayer video and get hundreds of people praying for you, okay? Christian Ministry Central. Subscribe to it. Make comments. Hit the bell so you get notified every time I put something out. And use it as a way to engage in ministry. That's what I'm doing with it. Let's take a minute. Pray. We'll jump into this message. Father, speak to us uh, from 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. Change our lives with it, Father. Make us different because we heard from you. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2012, the general sales manager at Sanderson Ford retired. I worked at Sanderson Ford. I was a salesman at Sanderson. I pastored churches for 30 years, okay, 74 to 2005. And I worked at Sanderson Ford from 2005 to 2018. But the general sales manager at that great, great place uh, retired in 2012. And he had worked there for 52 years. And he is best friends with the owner. They've been in high school together. They've been friends all their lives. He had, this this guy I'm talking about, the general sales manager who retired, passed away last year. Great, great guy. Neil Schrock was his name. Uh, and he was he's known. Uh, he's what is known as a car guy. Okay, he and the and the owner. And when when he retired, the owner presented him with a restored 1934 Ford five window sedan. It was blue and had, had uh, uh, like most restored hot rods like that, typically haven't had a 302 Chevy uh, uh, engine in it, a V8 engine. Now, they're Ford guys, okay? These guys are Ford guys. I knew Neil, I knew the owner, and I knew that they were hardcore car guys, but they were Ford guys, okay? I suspected that a change in the Chevy engine was forthcoming. Why? because the true nature of the car was that it was a Ford, not a Chevy. And they do this in all these hot rods. They take these beautiful Ford hot rods and put Chevy engines in them, which I don't understand. And I figured a change was coming. In a similar way, God recreates us to reflect his nature, which is holy. He does a recreation in us. I'm gonna take a look at that today. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your minds fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. First, prepare your minds for action. Therefore, takes us back to a discussion of salvation that starts in 1 Peter 1, 9. It says, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Since you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls, prepare your minds for action. That's the point. Everything said up to this point is just stating facts and reality. Beginning in verse 13, the language changes to imperative, meaning that he is giving demands for action. He's saying, go do this. And it's not a suggestion, it's a command. Since you are receiving the salvation of your souls, then the call is to do some things differently than you've done them in the past. Since you're saved, you're supposed to be different. That's the point. Prepare your minds for action. A more literal translation would be, gird the loins of your minds for action. This refers to men wearing a long tunic type outer garment back in, you know, 2000 years ago, and they wore a belt. If they were getting ready to work hard or to go into battle as a soldier, 
they would gather the tunic into the belt, tying it up to make it easier to move. They were girding their loins to prepare for action. The point is that since you're receiving the salvation of your souls, get ready for action to do life differently than you did before. <clears throat> since you're receiving the salvation of your souls, be, listen to this, self-controlled. The Greek word here is a word for staying clear of excessive use of wine so that you did not lose control of yourselves. In other words, don't get drunk. Be under control, okay? Be under self-control. Make sure that you're under the control of yourself, not out of control as though you were drunk, okay? It is possible to, so, to be so emotionally out of control that you respond controlled by emotion in the moment instead of being controlled by yourself. There's other things other than alcohol that can control you or drugs. Just the way you think, you know, your emotions of the moment. Sometimes stupidity can control you. There's all kinds of things that can control you. The work of God happens when you are under self-control so that we can conscience, consciously yield control to the Lord of our free will. It's always about yielding control to the Lord of our free will. S some today think that being controlled by the Lord assumes that you're out of control. Wrong! A thousand times wrong. Way confused. The scripture always assumes and teaches that God moves and is controlled when we are self-controlled and yield control to him consciously. Control by God emerges from self-control when we intentionally surrender control to him. That is not possible without self-control. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Preparing your minds for action requires self-control. Preparing our minds for action also requires that we have our hope fully set on the grace that will be revealed when Jesus is revealed. When you see the word hope, think hope in the sense of assurance. Assurance. Always think assurance when you see the word hope, in the New, especially in the New Testament. <clears throat> we have assurance because of the complete grace that will come to us when Jesus returns at the day of the Lord. We have assurance of heaven. That's what that means. Christians are not nearly focused enough on the return of Christ when grace is fully expressed and fully known. Grace is expressed and fully known when Jesus comes back to take us to be with him in heaven. Grace is full and known fully when Jesus returns and establishes, sets up his eternal kingdom in a heaven, in a new heaven and a new earth. Then our hope is revealed completely. We, we retain it completely. It comes to us. We're in it. We are assured of it forever. It's heavenly glory in the presence of God. Heaven and the streets of gold and all that stuff were taken to be with him <clears throat> in heavenly glory. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 defines when grace is complete. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the, in the air. And so we shall be with the Lord forever. When we are true to our true nature, we prepare our minds for action by being self-controlled and setting our hope on the complete grace that is coming when Jesus returns to take the Christ follower, whether living or dead, to be with him in his heavenly in his heavenly kingdom. That happens when Jesus comes back, okay? Second, 1 Peter 1, 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil, evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, okay? Second, be an obedient child. Be an obedient child. Do not conform is an imperative participle, meaning it is a command. It's a command, not a suggestion. An obedient child will not conform to the evil desires that he had before he was converted to Christ. Yes, he's still a child, but he's a child of God. And he's supposed to be different and conform to God's desires, not the world's desires. 
The child of God does not conform to the evil desires he had before conversion to Christ. He's transformed all the time. He's being changed all the time to be more godly, more conformed to the image of God. Don't let your previous evil desires squeeze you into their mold. Control your evil desires by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Remembering that when the evil desires were in control, you were operating without the power of the Holy Spirit. But now you're operating with the power of the Holy Spirit, with such internal power from God. The Holy Spirit is the person present, the power of God living in you, okay? With such internal power, there's no reason for the evil one to get you to be squeezed into his evil mold. Instead, the power in you, which is the power of God, should mold you into the mold of the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, who is, again, the person, the presence, and the power of God. Notice that in the past you conformed to evil desires when you lived in ignorance. Ignorance. You no longer live in ignorance concerning the things of God so, so as to be influenced to do evil. Now we live under the word of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, so that we can be an obedient child and not be a disobedient child. When we are true to our nature, we will be an obedient child of God to our new nature. Why? Because we've been born again, you know. So third, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Be holy as God is holy. The desire of God has always been that his people be holy. Why? Because he's holy. He wants his people to be like him. That started back in Leviticus 11, and 40, 44 and 45. I am the Lord, your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. Notice that in Leviticus, the command is to consecrate yourselves. Under the new covenant, God does a work in our lives, forgiving our sins based on the blood of Christ and putting his person, presence, and power inside our lives, who is the Holy Spirit. He comes to live in us, and he sets us apart when we surrender to Christ. The Holy Spirit sets us apart when we surrender to Jesus, make him the Lord of our life. And guess what we become? We become the work of God. We become the work of God, and he does a work in our lives. Notice that we are to be holy as he who called us is holy. Who called us? The Lord called us. We're under the divine call, not just to be saved, but to be holy like God is. We are also empowered to be holy. We are also the work of God to be holy. Under the old covenant in Leviticus, in Leviticus back in the Old Testament, it was up to the person to be holy by law, okay? No one made it. Everyone blew it. We still do, okay? Under the new covenant, the call is to be holy, but I'm not on my own. I have help. I have someone helping me, and the guy helping me is holy, so he can help me be like he is. Jesus made it clear that he was going to give us some help, okay? And we need it. And he did that in John 14, 16 through 18. Listen to what Jesus said. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The call is still to be self-controlled and to come under holiness by my choice and free will. But under Jesus' new covenant, we have the counselor. He is the spirit of truth and functions in our lives to empower, to empower us to conformity. We have power from God working in us to make us different and holy and clean and pure and transformed. He changes us from the inside out. 1966, long time ago, I was 17. I was driving my 1956 Ford Crown Victoria 
Wish I still had that car. I sold it to some knucklehead in Flagstaff, Arizona for for a hundred bucks back in those days. But as I, I was driving around in that car one day, and as I drove down the street, I saw this 1956 Chevy Bel Air painted red, tuck and troll, toll and truck tuck and roll interior, as they called it in the day, and mag wheels, which were brand new in 1966. And there's a sign on this beautiful car. You know, it had obviously been, a lot of work had been done to it. And the sign on the car said, for sale, 300 bucks. Well, even in 1956, that was really, really cheap. So I stopped and went and knocked on the door of the house. And I asked the guy who came to the door how he could sell that Chevy for 300 bucks, that beautiful Chevy. Took me over to the car, he popped the hood, and I saw it. You know why? No engine. There wasn't any engine in that car. Under the old covenant, the engine to empower holiness was missing. But under the new covenant, the engine has been installed. He is the person, the presence, and the power of God. And with our surrender can make us holy or separate for God, just as God is holy. The power of the Holy Spirit is the engine that drives holiness. You need to remember that. The nature of the new creation in Christ is to be holy as he is holy, which includes preparing our minds for action and being obedient children. Remember that 1934 Ford five-window sedan with the 302 Chevy engine? I suspected that a change was coming because it was a Ford, not a Chevy. I didn't see it around for about six months. <laughs> Then one day, about six months later, Neil pulled in in the car. Totally redone. Had a five liter Ford V8 with a blower on it, a C4 automatic transmission, had been repainted black with new interior, new air conditioning, new power, everything. Totally, totally, totally transformed hot rod. Amazing car. You could hear it coming too. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It had been redone to reflect the nature of a Ford, not a Chevy. God wants to redo our lives to ones of holiness. He wants us to be holy. He will empower the redo. Just surrender to his power and influence and he will feel, fulfill his call to holiness in your life. He will do a work in you and make you different. We all need that, don't we? We all need that. Let's pray. Father, I, uh, I come before you and I pray that you would empower our call to holiness with the power of the Holy Spirit and that we would be transformed. We would have a new nature and that you would empower it and, and bring us to the reality of holiness. Make us new because of Jesus is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your heart. Have a great day and I will talk to you again soon.